that much of a heat at all. <laughs> We're now about to open the afternoon session. Uh, for everyone, this is quite a long session. It's four speakers instead of three. And then we have Q&A, and then we have a much needed tea and coffee break, and then you've all got to stay and watch the film on the beach, even if you've seen it before. <clears throat> um, so our first speaker is Greg Mello. Greg is Secretary and Executive Director of the Los Alamos Study Group, and he's led, has led its various activities since 1989, which have included policy research, environmental analysis, congressional education and lobbying, community organising, litigation, advertising, and the nuts and bolts of running a small profit, small non-profit. From time to time, Greg has served as a consultant analyst and writer for other nuclear policy organisations. He was educated originally as an engineer and regional planner. He led the first environmental enforcement at Los Alamos National Lab. He was a hydrogeologist at the New Mexico Environment Department and later a consultant to industry. In 2002, Greg was a visiting research fellow at Princeton's program on science and global security. His research analysis and opinions have been published in the New York Times, Washington Post, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist, Issues in Science and Technology, in the New Mexico Press and elsewhere. His title is The Role and Funding of the US Nuclear Weapons Labs. Thank you so much, Helen. It's, um, it's a wonderful gathering, uh, and uh, it's been very stimulating so far for me, certainly. Um, we have to pick up now where the other panel, the, the before lunch, uh, let off, and I am, because of where we are and because of Helen is bringing us back to the medical model so patiently, um, and I guess the first thing I would start out with is that we are challenged here to become doctors. We, recognizing the disease, we can't just talk about the disease, which we would like to do because we are verbal people, but we want to become doctors, which means actually seeing patients. Um, Lewis Mumford remarked in the 1950s that uh, about the scientist movement that um, even though scientists who developed the bomb were very concerned about its effects, they remained in their laboratories, they remained in their universities, and we're fortunate to have some exceptions to the this uh, ivory tower mentality here with us today that um, but I think we have to challenge ourselves and challenge others to uh, leave business as usual in our own lives in order to foment and inspire others. Mumford said that the scientist movement in the 19, late 1940s and 1950s wasn't fruitful because the scientists stayed in their laboratories. That was the, the fundamental problem with it. There was nothing wrong with the content of what they said. It was that they stayed in the labs. So this brings us to the labs, um, which are a small but important part of, uh, of this problem of uh, human survival. The quotes that I have put um, on the cover here are uh, from a some practitioners from the inside that are remarking on changes that have occurred in the nuclear weapons laboratories in the relatively recent time. Um, let's see here, this works. And you, you can read those uh, yourself, I think. Bob Querifoy is a very important um, person, um, extensively um, uh, quoted recently in um, Command and Control by Eric Schlosser. Um, and has been an activist in his retirement. Uh, 
the transition from public service to private enterprise and um, greed, as a previous generation might have called it, is both a tremendous danger, but it is also part of the opportunity that we have because a weapons complex founded on greed and corporate profit is not a very functional weapons complex. Um, I wanted to say something that we could skip over, um, that nuclear extinction is going to begin somewhere. And usually the way people think about it is it's not us. It's not human beings, it's, it's some other species far away, or it's, it's some people far away. It's, um, and I think that we have to fight against a politics of disposability wherever we find it. And um, the key triage that I think that we have to be concerned about is the triage of our time and attention. I also wanted to emphasize that we don't know what uh, will happen when the nuclear detonation occurs. Um, I, I was in uh, Vienna at two conferences about the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons, and I felt there was a systematic understatement of the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons at those conferences, despite um, every attempt to incorporate the effects of nuclear weapons. We have heard today references to this inchoate, unknowable, post-nuclear reality, um, but just because we can't predict it and don't know it doesn't mean that it's not important. How well will we cope with uh, any major problem of the world if there is a single nuclear weapon detonated anywhere? What kind of polity, what kind of um, response will we have to any of the other major problems that we face. And I, I wanted to say, since it's been, it hasn't been emphasized quite enough yet, that we face nuclear extinction from the sun. And this we face because of business as usual, even if we avoid nuclear extinction by nuclear war, if we continue with our present way of life, with our present capitalist structure, with our present effort to dominate, with our present resource extraction, we will certainly bring about a catastrophic level of global warming and mass extinctions across the planet, which may or may not include human beings. The likelihood of us successfully addressing that problem or other problems that we face while also threatening nuclear extermination as a matter of national policy, which becomes deeply ingrained in our national psyche, the level of violence that we accept and normalize, and it becomes prestigious through the prestigious institutions that I want to talk about, that prestigious normalized violence becomes a block to us doing anything positive about anything. That's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm here today. I think we also have to uh, be aware that um, extinction, while we think of it as an all or nothing thing, it, uh, ecologists might emphasize the, the patchwise processes that occur. Um, that I live in a, in a dry state. Uh, I don't know whether there's any more bears in the Sandia Mountains. Global warming and climate change may have already gotten rid of them. We don't know. Um, this is review. I'm going to skip over this, except um, I want to say that, um, point out that uh, in the Department of Defense and its military contractors, there's overall a ratio of about one federal employee to two contractors. That's because of all the people in the military. In the Department of Energy and its subsidiary, the NNSA, the ratio is about one fed to 20 contractors. So the Department of Energy is the most privatized federal department, and within that, the nuclear weapons enterprise is the most privatized part of, of DOE. Um, and you've all heard about uh, how expensive 
um, this all will be if these modernization plans go forward to their conclusion, which I think the chan chances of that are quite remote. Um, Bill gave a very, very good talk on uh, the nuclear weapons complex and the, and the military industrial complex generally. Um, this is an old map of uh, sort of the um, nuclear weapons complex. The white um, sites are DOE sites, the remaining DOE sites. You can see there are two of them in my state. Um, our ratio of nuclear weapons spending to state uh, product is uh, about 11 times greater than the next state, which is Tennessee. Um, the two red sites uh, are centers of contracting and administration. Um, all right. Uh, this is a little bit of the history of the funding. Um, I want to focus now more on the, uh, focusing in on the labs, on the Department of Energy part of this business. This is a history of funding. Uh, there, uh, there's a divergence um, of those lines there because some include administration and some don't. And then here, uh, that flat green one estimates 2% inflation during the future your uh, national security program. But you can see that the um, spending level is quite high relative to the Cold War and that um, it has taken off uh, in the Obama period. Um, this is the nuclear weapons uh, budget of the Department of Energy broken down by site in then your dollars. And you can see here something we'll talk about a little bit more, which is the takeoff in the three laboratories um, in the decade following the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, they became uh, much uh, more richly funded entities uh, after the CTPT. This um, spike here I don't really fully understand. It's contracting out of Washington. And this new entity here is the corporate combination of Y-12 and Pantex. The contractors are already complaining that they can't freely move money from site to site, uh, that they need to have congressional um, approval to do that, which is annoying to them. Uh, this is the same graph in 2014 dollars, um, which uh, shows uh, that same uh, spike during the, uh, started during Clinton and continued in the first part of the Bush administration. All right, I thought that maybe it'd be a good idea to go over the a short abridged history of the weapons lab since the Cold War to give you an idea of some of the issues involved. And I, like Bill, I'm tempted to go all the way back to the beginning because sitting in our office thinking about this talk, it, it fell in on us, on um, uh, my wife and co-worker and myself, how the, the nuclear weapons labs have repeated the same themes through history. The slogans change, there's novelty in administration, but there's an enormous continuity. The DNA of the nuclear weapons labs has remained remarkably constant. The first thing that jumped out at me was that the people in charge of the Manhattan Project knew 17 months before the Trinity test that Germany was on the road to defeat. So Los Alamos was founded the same month as the Russian victory in Stalingrad. Project Alsos went through Europe and the uh, information began to come back um, by the time they interviewed Joliot Curie, it was all clear, um, but that was when the work truly speeded up. It was uh, starting from March 1944, it was understood by General Groves, as well as the leading scientist at Los Alamos, that this was a project about post-war domination. There was a dinner at the Chadwick's house in Los Alamos that Joseph Rotblat was at and wrote about subsequently where General Groves said, this is about controlling Russia after the war. That was in um, March of 1944. All the information about how there wasn't a German bomb program was all in hand by the end of 44, and that's when Joseph Rotbach quit. So 
the, the two lessons that you, drew, that you get from this and much more history is that deception is baked into the DNA, both for internal morale purposes as well as for funding, for CYA, for everything. And the second is that the bureaucracies once set in motion cannot absorb new information from the real world. So we have a changing natural, national security situation today, but the nuclear weapons complex and the military industrial complex cannot absorb this information. It will be decades, if ever, before they could ever, they will only absorb things if it's profitable. And they have built now a system of such inordinate profitability that they can't learn. They can't manage, they can't finish projects, and they can't learn. The salaries at the weapons laboratories are among the most highly guarded secrets out there. I can give you a few hints. Um, there's about 1,000 people at each weapons laboratory that make on the order of 350,000 a year. This is much more than cabinet officials or members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. These are not senior scientists. These are mid-career people. Um, the average compensation at the weapons laboratories is on the order of 180,000. That includes pension and health care and so forth. The directors of the laboratories make a million and a half or even more. The uppermost management is um, also very highly compensated. No one can make this kind of money in the real world. And so they're locked into a situation where they can't change, they can't work on things that they could, they would have to compete with people at universities or anywhere else in society, they're locked in. And I think that a lot of the activists don't really get this when they think, oh, well, we'll, we'll get them to work on some green project or we'll get them to do something uh, that will verify a nuclear weapons free world or something like that. They forget things like conflict of interest. They forget um, the um, how much they don't really know how much money they're making, and they don't know um, how little expertise of any broad sense is present in these laboratories. Manuel Garcia, um, who worked at Livermore, is probably um, he, he said you can't you can't change these to something else any more than you could change a battleship into a bicycle. You have to melt it down and you can make a bicycle, you know, lots of bicycles, but you can't change them. Now, this is all taking a lot of time. Um, uh, I, there's only like three minutes left, something like that? Yeah, okay. Um, the most important thing from this long series of slides, which I'm not going to be able to show you, and is that, are that, um, I guess I'll go, uh, this is sort of a, a little history of the Cold War in the weapons laboratories. What we did not understand in the beginning, but we do understand now, is that the Cold War was only over on one side. Um, we, and that's why I put in a little, uh, as Bill did also about PNAC, um, w there was an end run around reform. Uh, and, and there have been phases of breakout from government control. One person in government um, remarked to me that the laboratory's basic business plan is to substitute themselves for the government decision-making process, control all the information that could make it possible for government to reassert its authority, and to blackmail the government if any attempt is made to uh, change either of the first two conditions. The, black, the blackmail is accomplished through the annual stockpile certification letter and through um, a broader suite of political activities which, in which they engage. So at any time there might be 100 or 200, there were up to 400 long-term change of station assignments from the DOE laboratories in DOE headquarters making policy, reading speeches, writing, you know, reviewing the nuclear posture review, 
Um, you could have a meeting, an uh, interagency meeting about nuclear weapons policy and sit it down in a room with one guy from Livermore, one guy from Los Alamos, and another guy from Los Alamos, and it's uh, because they're all there on a change of station assignment taking federal roles. Um, and so the, it goes beyond lobbying to simply replacement of government. And it, this is so confusing that even Senator Feinstein was, uh, did not know that the, that the directors of the weapons laboratories are contractors. She thought they were federal. Um, so we've had a, a, a long-term breakout uh, in phases since the Cold War, which has been facilitated by political deals that were entered into in good, with good intentions, but the result has been catastrophic. So the, we have to, the nuclear weapons live through their institutions, whether those institutions are Lockheed Martin or an uh, ICBM base or weapons laboratories. And the health of those institutions and the funding of those institutions is very closely associated with the, their political power and uh, their influence over policy and the strength of their, the power of their ideology. So when you make a deal that gives more money or even an unlimited amount of money to the weapons laboratories in return for a, new, for a policy goal uh, in today's privatized environment, as opposed to the Kennedy administration, uh, when it uh, seemed to work, seemed, um, then you're really asking for trouble. Um, there have been about 55 studies of lab reform over the last um, 20 years, and uh, there's no effective reform that has taken place. So we'll skip all of the study groups, my ideas for reform here. Um, okay, the good news uh, is that, that this system is in crisis from incompetence uh, and collapsing project management, um, from collapsing workload. Small victories on the margin have created a workload, a looming workload crisis, which was, um, which the laboratories are very conscious of this. In fact, the weapons complex as a whole is. Um, if they don't have new warheads, if they don't have warheads to upgrade at Pantex, they will have to start taking them apart. Um, that's, not a, that's not joking. That's, um, the, the resource issues that our society faces are opportunities for us, um, as are the management failures. We should not insulate the weapons complex from the effects of its management failures by offering unlimited funding streams. Um, the, I don't uh, see the possibility of a single issue disarmament movement in the United States because of the intensive co-optation of NGO and civil society activity in the United States by um, the philanthropic foundations that are closely associated with the State Department. I don't see that happening. There's, uh, we are not that politically educated or organized at this point in time. However, I do see the possibility of a broader based resistance movement based on, on issues of dignity, justice, and uh, bread and butter financial uh, issues that really cut very close to a home for a lot of people, of which nuclear weapons can piggyback on. And that's it, I think. So, thank you. Thanks, Greg. A very important part of the symposium. The next speaker is Seth Baum. He's executive director of the Global Catastrophic Risk Institute a non-profit think tank that Baum co-founded in 2011. His research focuses on risk, ethics, and policy questions for major threats to human civilizations, including nuclear war, global warming, and emerging technologies. He received a PhD in geography from 
Pennsylvania State University and his research has appeared in many journals, including Acta Astronomica, Ecological Economics, Science and Engineering Ethics, Science and Global Security and Sustainability. He also writes a monthly column for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. He's based in New York. The title is A Catastrophic Risk of Nuclear War. Seth. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for having me. It's, it's really an honor to speak at this wonderful event. So, uh, as you mentioned, I work for the Global Catastrophic Risk Institute. We are an independent, nonprofit think tank studying major th risks to the survival of human civilization. And we also help develop practical and effective solutions for reducing the risk. Uh, and I should clarify that uh, in this talk, uh, the views expressed are my own views and not the views of the Institute. So in this talk, I'll be discussing the risk of nuclear war. Uh, I'll be discussing the, uh, the risk of nuclear war, uh, including why this is such a major risk and also some of the things that we can do to reduce the risk. But before getting into the details of the risk analysis, I'll say a few words about why the global catastrophic risks are so important. Okay, all right, I'll talk. Is this better? All right. Okay, so why, why the global catastrophic risks are so important. So to see this, it helps to take a step back and look at the big picture. So imagine, that you're alive here on Earth five billion years from now. Now, five billion years, this is towards the upper limit of when it is physically possible to live here on Earth. The sun gradually gets warmer, and over billions of years, eventually it becomes too hot for life as we know it to exist here on Earth. Of course, billions of years from now, we might not just exist here on Earth we might have spread out across the stars into an immense galactic civilization that dwarfs anything that we could have here on Earth. The global catastrophes, these are the events that could mean success or failure, that could ruin all of this great, beautiful future that could exist for, for many people. And so imagine yourself living here on Earth five billion years from now, part of all of this. Imagine looking back on the whole of human history. And imagine what you would think about what we have here today. Would we succeed at avoiding global catastrophe such that all of this could happen? Or would we fail denying countless members of countless future generations the chance to ever live? So when we talk about the catastrophic risk of nuclear war, by far the biggest thing at stake is no less than the entire fate of human civilization. So, could nuclear war be that event that makes that difference? Well, we know that a nuclear weapon can cause an enormous explosion. And we know that that explosion can cause great damage and kill many people. But a singular, single nuclear explosion on its own would not mean the end of human civilization. And in fact, the biggest risk from nuclear weapons is not the explosion itself, but the smoke from the firestorm that rises high up into the atmosphere. And as Alan Robach and his colleagues have done an excellent job of showing, that smoke then spreads all around the world, where it blocks incoming sunlight, cooling the surface of the planet, and reducing precipitation. These extreme environmental conditions make it very difficult for plants to grow, including the plants that we grow for our food. One study looked at a nuclear war with 100 nuclear weapons and looked at the environmental consequences and the famine that could come from that and found that two billion people could be at risk of starvation. Now here's where things get a little interesting because if two billion people die, then obviously this would be an enormous catastrophe. But the death of two billion people on its own might not make the difference in the long-term fate of human civilization. After all, if two billion people die, there are still five billion people alive and able to carry humanity into the future. Now, 
To be clear, this does not mean that we should not care about the death of two billion people. We certainly should care about that. But it does mean that from the perspective of the entire future of human civilization, it might actually not make much of a difference. So what would make the difference? Well, what would make the difference would be the permanent collapse of global human civilization. Throughout human history, we have seen a number of civilizations come and go, some never to return. And indeed, some of these collapses have been driven by environmental problems. However, none of these civilizations come anywhere close to the scale and sophistication of the modern global civilization that we live in today. And so it's very difficult to say whether or not a nuclear war would cause the permanent collapse of global human civilization. One thing we can say, though, is that the larger the nuclear war is, the more likely it is to result in a permanent collapse. I developed this point in a new paper, oops, new paper coming out in the journal Contemporary Security Policy, where I compare the size of the nuclear war to the probability of permanent catastrophe from that war. If there are zero weapons, then there is no nuclear war and in turn no probability of a permanent catastrophe from it. If there are 16,000 weapons used, which is about the number that there are across the world today, then there is a high probability of such a permanent catastrophe. How high is it? It's hard to say exactly how high, but plenty high enough for this to, to be something that we should be worried a lot about. I say that uh, for the probability of a permanent catastrophe from the environmental consequences of nuclear war to be insignificantly small, so small that we have more important things to worry about, including all of the other catastrophic risks that are out there. I suggest a threshold of maybe around 50 nuclear weapons. This gives a fairly small chance of this happening. Now, I want to pause and say two things about this. First, my study only looked at the environmental consequences of nuclear war. You can imagine a nuclear war with, say, 30 or 40 nuclear weapons, especially if they hit major cities, taking out important nodes in the global economy, then there are important systemic effects from that, and perhaps you could end up with a permanent catastrophe from that as well. This is something that has not yet been accounted for. And second, even if human civilization can survive into the distant future with 30 or 50 or however many nuclear weapons, that doesn't mean that it's a bad idea to aim for zero nuclear weapons total in the world. There are still plenty of good reasons to push for zero total nuclear weapons. But the important thing is not the distinction between zero or 50 nuclear weapons. The important thing is the distinction between either of those and the 16,000 nuclear weapons that we have on Earth today. It is imperative that we make sure that those 16,000 weapons are not used and that we reduce that number down to a safe level. Now, the discussion so far has just been about the severity of a nuclear war if a nuclear war occurs. A full discussion of the risk should also look at the probability of nuclear war. After all, if there's no chance of a nuclear war ever happening, then we don't need to worry about the severity of the consequences if it does happen. And indeed, there are some people who would say that the probability is basically zero. After all, nuclear war has never happened before. Well, okay, that's, that's not quite correct. There has been a nuclear war. World War II was a nuclear war. But it is true that there has never been a large nuclear war with 50 or, or 16,000 nuclear weapons. That much never has before. But it would be a mistake to say that just because it's never happened before, therefore it's impossible. This is the same mistake that people in Britain made several centuries ago when they believed that black swans were impossible. To them, all swans are white. They had never seen a black swan before. But it turns out there are black swans. They live in Australia. There's a photograph of one right there. And so they made the mistake of believing just because they had never seen it before, therefore it couldn't happen. So it is with black swans, so too for nuclear war. There's another mistake, though. Researchers call it the observation selection effect. If a large enough war, nuclear war could kill all of us, and maybe it could, 
If it could, then the fact that we are here observing that no nuclear war has ever happened before requires that no nuclear war has ever happened before. We could only observe such a large nuclear war for that brief moment when we're dying from it. And so the fact that we're here today having this conversation requires that such a war has never happened. So we can't say, we cannot say that the probability is zero just because we've never seen it before. So what can we say? Well, one thing we can do is look at the history that we have observed and learn what we can from that. For example, the Cuban Missile Crisis is perhaps the closest the world has ever come to a nuclear war. Martin Hellman of Stanford University developed a model of the probability of nuclear war from crises like the Cuban Missile Crisis. The model went through the series of steps from the relative calm before the crisis, to the missiles being found, which started the crisis, to the crisis itself, shown in black because this is what has previously happened, and then in red, what has not previously happened, a nuclear weapon being used from that crisis, and that escalating into a full nuclear war. And for the probability of each step going on to the next step, he estimated that for in black, looking at the history we've observed, and then in red, using a range of numbers, because this has never happened before, there's some uncertainty about what the probability would be. When you multiply all these numbers together, you get an answer for the total probability of nuclear war from this type of crisis. Well, here you get a range, because we have a range of numbers underneath. The range is once per 200 years to once per 5,000 years, is what Martin Hellman found in this study. Now, once per 200 years, once per 5,000 years, these might seem like low probabilities. This might seem like a rare event. And it's true. This type of nuclear war is unlikely to occur this year or next year or the year after that. But the longer we wait, the more likely it is to occur. And it is basically impossible for us to expect that we can continue existing into the distant future, certainly not billions of years from now, without one of these nuclear wars happening. So this is for the probability of one type of nuclear war. Another type is what's called inadvertent nuclear war. We heard a little bit about this earlier today. Inadvertent nuclear war is when one side misinterprets a false alarm as a real attack and launches nuclear weapons in what it believes is a counterattack, but is in fact the first strike. Now, inadvertent nuclear war is important because it means we could end up in nuclear war even if deterrence works perfectly. Okay, what's deterrence? Deterrence is a threatening the other side with some sort of punishment to convince them not to do something you don't want them to do. In this case, threatening the other side with nuclear retaliation, since neither side wants to be hit with that retaliation, neither side launches nuclear weapons, it's a way of avoiding nuclear war. And nuclear deterrence works, but it does not work perfectly. The history we've seen, in Cu including the Cuban Missile Crisis, show that nuclear deterrence does not work perfectly. But even if it did work perfectly, we could still end up in an inadvertent nuclear war, because in this case, that, that other side actually was deterred. But the one side believed that they were under attack anyways, and so we ended up in a nuclear war. Over the years, there have been a number of close calls, some of which are shown here on this slide. False alarms that were at least briefly believed to be an actual nuclear attack. It includes computer glitches, a scientific rocket launch that people thought was a nuclear missile. Fortunately, in each of these cases, no nuclear weapons were launched. However, in the future, we might not be so fortunate. My colleagues and I modeled the probability of inadvertent nuclear war between the United States and Russia by using what's called a fault tree model. Now, in a fault tree model, uh, different scenarios branch out, each of which could be at fault for causing an inadvertent nuclear war. The leaves at the bottoms of these branches are two types of false alarms and two conditions in which the false alarms could occur. The first type is the usual false alarms, which uh, we saw examples of on the previous slide. And the other type is a nuclear terrorist attack that is misinterpreted as an attack from another country. The two conditions are crisis conditions between the two countries, in this case, the United States and Russia, and uh, conditions of no crisis, of relative calm between the countries.
And so we modeled the series of steps of going through the chain of command from receiving the false alarm all the way up to the top where the decision to launch is made. And at each step, you have a probability of the launch occurring. And we used a range of possible numbers for those probabilities, because these probabilities are themselves uncertain. And we did the same for the probability of there being a crisis between those two countries. When you multiply through all these possible numbers, you get a range of results for the probability of inadvertent nuclear war between the United States and Russia. We looked at two cases. One, if this war could happen at any time, and two, if it could only happen during crisis. And there's a fairly wide range, 14 or 20 years to once per 5,000 or 100,000 range years. It's a wide range because this is a fairly uncertain risk. But when we look at the average 50 or 100 years, or even if we look at the low probabilities, once per 5,000 or 100,000 years, this is clearly something that we cannot exist into the future that long for without seeing one of these nuclear wars. One thing you notice from this is that the probability is a lot lower if it can only happen during a crisis. And this teaches us something. We can reduce the probability of inadvertent nuclear war by avoiding crises. I mean, this makes sense, right? If you're in a crisis, you're more likely to believe that you actually are under attack. And so in practical terms, this means doing things like resolving the conflict over Ukraine, which has increased tensions between the United States and Russia, or making sure that uh, no crisis ever occurs over Taiwan that could raise tensions between the United States and China, or other conflicts around the world between other nuclear armed countries. Indeed, this is a core reason for doing this type of detailed risk analysis, because at each step in the process, on both the probability of it happening and the severity of the consequences, we see opportunities to reduce the risk. And we also get some understanding for how effective those opportunities would be at reducing the total amount of the risk. Now, you might be listening to this and thinking, OK, so what can I do to, to help out, to help reduce the risk? Well, I would encourage you to look at some of the NGOs, some of the non-governmental organizations that we'll be hearing about from other speakers in this conference this weekend. These are great NGOs working all around the world, doing excellent work on nuclear weapons and other issues. On nuclear weapons, a lot of the work focuses on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. By drawing attention to that, it discourages countries from using their weapons and encourages them to disarm. This is an excellent strategy with a great track record on other weapons, and they're off to an excellent start with it on nuclear weapons. And so if you're looking for a way to get involved to help reduce the risk of nuclear war, then this is a very good place to start. At the beginning of the talk, we learned about the great, beautiful future the human civilization can enjoy if only no major global catastrophe ruins it all. So the question is, how do we get from here to there? And the answer is by understanding the risks and by seizing the opportunities that we have to reduce the risks. Thank you. Thanks, Seth. Our next speaker is Bob Alvarez from the Alvarez from the Institute of Policy Studies. He's a senior scholar at the Institute of Policy Studies, where he's currently focused on nuclear disarmament, environmental, and energy policies. Between 1993 and 1999, Mr. Alvarez served as senior policy advisor to the Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and the Environment. While at the Department of Energy, he coordinated the effort to enact nuclear worker compensation legislation. In 1994 and 95, he led teams in North Korea to establish control of nuclear weapons materials. He coordinated nuclear materials strategic planning for the department and established the department's first asset management program. Bob was awarded two secretarial gold medals the highest awards given by the Department of Energy. 
In 1975, Bob helped found and direct the Environmental Policy Institute, EPI, a respected national public interest organisation. And I just would mention Kitty Tucker is here, who is Bob's wife, and it's her birthday today. Bob. Uh, as this my uh, proclivity... Oh, okay. All right. You got to swallow this thing. All right. As is my proclivity, I like to jam as much information as I can into presentation. So about a week or so ago, I sent Helen a, a bunch of slides that took up about two hours, and she was very polite about it. <laughs> but I didn't know I did it deliberately to pull her leg, but uh, she was very polite about it. Uh, so what I've done, I've, I've had to uh, sort of downsize this, and so um, uh, in lieu of better words, uh, put your trays in an upright position, put your seat belts on, here we go. Uh, as some of you, are, you know, is that uh, in the spring of this year, uh, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference will take place. It occurs every five years, and now it's been agreed upon to do this indefinitely every five years at the United Nations in New York City. And the treaty was uh, essentially adopted and enacted uh, into force in 1970, uh, and um, it uh, was essentially a, an interesting product of consensus amongst the Cold War rivals between Russia or Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, and it has uh, three basic pillars to it. Uh, one is the, for the nuclear, the, the, the nuclear weapon states that were identified as official at that time, the United States, uh, Soviet Union, uh, Russia, United Kingdom, France, and China, would undertake good faith just efforts to, for the complete uh, disarmament, nuclear disarmament, and general disarmament. Uh, the second pillar was that, um, uh, countries could, uh, could have the right to uh, seek to develop the peaceful uses of nuclear energy and, and that the third pillar was that those who did would forswear developing nuclear weapons would agree to undergo uh, international safeguards and security. Now there are other provisions of this treaty which are, uh, that we are now growing to uh, uh, regret. Uh, for example, Article 5 approved of peaceful nuclear explosions. Um, some of you may not, may not re remember that. Uh, something that India did uh, in 1974, uh, declared it a peaceful nuclear explosion, but it didn't uh, pass the uh, laugh test. Uh, the other is Article 10, which gives nations the, quote, un inalienable, unquote, right to develop uh, uranium enrichment and reprocessing. These are very proliferation-sensitive technologies. Um, Nuclear power in and of itself is inherently a dual-use a dual technology that can uh, be used to develop nuclear weapons. Uh, it, it was recognized as such very early on. Uh, most people don't realize that the first major uh, generator of nuclear power and electricity was essentially a dual-purpose reactor operated at the Hanford site between 1963 and 87. It was the largest producer of nuclear electricity in the 1960s, and it was also producing plutonium for the U.S. nuclear weapons program. Uh, they, we also have reprocessing. This is a, uh, an overhead shot here of the, uh, 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 the Purex reprocessing plant in uh, Yambyan in North Korea. And we also have enrichment of uranium involving centrifuges and other technologies. Um, I'm going to give you a quiz on this one. Uh, I, I apologize. I should have put this in a more understandable form. But I, this, this particular table addresses the issue of how much plutonium is being generated by commercial nuclear power plants or nuclear power plants worldwide. By, by design, by reactor type. Um, the key to nuclear nonproliferation is not access to knowledge, it's access to the actual explosive materials. This is the essential uh, 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 safeguard that is required. Uh, the secrets of how to make nuclear weapons are not so secret anymore. Uh, the technologies, while some of them are hard to come by, can be obtained 
but it's the actual materials, especially plutonium, highly enriched uranium, and in, in certain cases, uranium-233. Uh, these are what are known as fissile materials or nuclear explosive materials. What this graph basically shows is that roughly one out of every five reactors in operation right now that are generating nuclear power worldwide are based on original designs to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. The top one, the PHWR, which is pressurized heavy water reactor, uh, this was a design, it was a workhorse for the United States nuclear weapons program at the Savannah River site. Uh, the, most of these reactors are in Canada, they're called CANDU reactors, but uh, this particular reactor uh, provided India with its plutonium for its first nuclear weapons. It's providing Pakistan with its uh, plutonium for nuclear weapons. And if you see the numbers here, it is a very, very uh, efficient plutonium producer. Uh, it's producing about twice as much weapons usable plutonium than our commercial nuclear power plants, uh, pressurized water, boiling water reactors. Uh, the RBMK beneath that is essentially a graphite moderated water cooled reactor uh, that are operating uh, in Russia right now. Uh, these, this is the Chern so called Chernobyl style reactor. They stole this design from the United States, and we were operating nine such reactors at the Hanford site uh, uh, to produce plutonium. We produced about 67.4 metric tons using this particular design reactor. Uh, then, in the, in the following down, you have the pressurized water reactors and the boiling water reactors, which really make up the great majority of reactors worldwide. And then you have the gas-cooled reactors. These are graphite-moderated gas-cooled reactors. Uh, these are reactors that fueled the British, French, North, and North Korean and Israeli nuclear weapons programs. Uh, they are now, they are generating electricity. They are part of the mix of global nuclear power. Uh, as you see this number here at the very, where it says global annual plutonium discharge in red, uh, nuclear power plants worldwide, there are about 427 of them. They are generating roughly 100 metric tons of plutonium a year, weapons usable plutonium a year. And uh, when all is said and done, uh, when this spent fuel is discharged from a reactor, it's, uh, as you may know, it's very highly radioactive, very difficult to handle. But after a period of several hundred years, what's really left over is the plutonium. And this becomes a really a long-term concern. Uh, what will we be doing with all this plutonium that we've been generating worldwide? The major challenges we face here, well, first of all, North Korea withdrew from the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. They've tested three nuclear weapons so far and threatened to unravel the nuclear nonproliferation regime of the Far East. Uh, Iran, where, as you know, we're in the process of trying to negotiate agreement, we being five nations led by the United States, uh, to somehow come to an agreement that would limit the uh, uh, degree and extent of uranium enrichment that Iran would, uh, would, 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 would develop in order to provide a nuclear fuel for its research program and its uh, power program. Uh, I think we should not in any way discount the Chernobyl and Fukushima nuclear disasters. I think they play a a very big role. They're, they're very, they play a very, very big, big role in, uh, in how we deal with nuclear dangers and uh, we, we have to start, start to bring nuclear safety much more to the forefront and recognize that these are ty type of reactors that deal literal body blows to entire nations. Uh, we have nuclear weapon states outside of the non-proliferation treaty such as Israel, India, Pakistan, uh, De Democratic Peoples of Republic of, of Korea, uh, all operating in unstable regions with long histories of conflict. Pakistan right now is producing more nuclear weapons than any other nation in the world. They're spending somewhere between 2.5 to $3 billion a year on making nuclear weapons. Uh, we've had uh, basically all, uh, glacial pace in terms of U.S. and Russia nuclear arms reductions and the stalling of multilateral nuclear agreements, such as a fissile material cutoff treaty. Uh, we have the, the risk of terrorist threat from unsecured fissile materials. Uh, President Obama has made it a high priority for nuclear security of these materials, but if you look very carefully at what we're talking about here in terms of preventing uh, people from getting their hands on these materials and making bombs and committing acts of malice, what we are doing is cleaning up after the Atoms for Peace Parade. 
The United States distributed a huge amount of highly enriched uranium worldwide in order to foster development of nuclear energy. Uh, we sent it to places like Congo in Katanga province where we still have some HEU there and it's, we haven't yet been able to retrieve it. Um, we we um, have the, the total discriminatory nature of safeguards and security under this treaty between nuclear weapon states and non-weapon states, which is to sort of do as I say, but not as I do, uh, which is a source of inherent tension. The nuclear weapon states, the United States, the UK, Russia, uh, France, and China, really are uh, at steadfastly opposed to undergoing the same level of scrutiny of their programs as those, peop as those entities that we suspect might want to be developing nuclear weapons. And then at the same time, the United States is sending really mixed signals uh, to other countries pr pursuing proliferation sensitive technologies. In 1970, the year that the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty entered into force, then chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, Glenn Seaborg, estimated that, uh, <clears throat> that by the end of the 20th century, there would be a thousand reactors dotting the American landscape. There would be a commensurately large number of reactors worldwide that the world would exhaust its supplies of uranium and that by this time the U.S. reactors alone would require 1,600 tons of plutonium to sustain their future. Uh, as some of you know it takes four to six kilograms. Uh, the, the amount of plutonium that was detonated over Nagasaki was six kilograms. We've sort of greatly reduced that. Uh, since then, but four to six kilograms. So at that time, he was basically uh, promoting the idea that we would have literally 1, 000, at least 1,600 tons of plutonium floating through international commerce. And think about just a small, tiny fraction of that amount of plutonium somehow being diverted and stolen. Uh, we still are pursuing these technologies, albeit in a lower level. Um, for many years, the United States was, uh, was, in, was, was, was one of the principal supporters of what they called the closed nuclear fuel cycle. This was based, again, on the whole notion that we would have so much, so much such spectacular nuclear power growth that we would run out of uranium and therefore we had to establish a, another uh, form of nuclear fuel, namely plutonium. And the idea here was that uh, the irradiated fuel would be, uh, would be removed from the reactor once after a certain period of time. It would be sent to a chemical separations plant where the plutonium and uranium would be extracted. The plutonium and uranium would be, quote, recycled and put back into reactors, and except these would be a different kind of reactors known as uh, fast reactors, because uh, this, these reactors, in order to have uh, significant quantities of plutonium in them, need fast neutrons to uh, generate the energy necessary to, to provide electricity as opposed to the reactors we now have which are based on thermal neutrons or slow neutrons. Um, I attended a hearing once uh, when I first got started about a fast reactor and uh, uh, a gentleman from the Atomic Energy Commission was being questioned about what would be happen if you lost the coolant. The coolant of these reactors is basically liquid sodium. Uh, and if you know anything about liquid sodium, if it comes into contact with air, it uh, basically spontaneously combusts. And so this senator asked this uh, government witness, well, what would happen if you had a loss of coolant in one of these reactors? And his reply was, well, we might have a rapid energetic disassembly. Uh, in this, this idea has been kicked around and is still kicked around. Uh, the United Kingdom has pretty much quit. Uh, they are stuck with a bunch of plutonium that they don't know what to do with. France is sort of limping around with a, a large amount of excess separated plutonium with no credible disposition. Japan is reeling from the Fukushima disaster and it remains to be seen whether they'll really be able to uh, establish a plutonium economy. Uh, and Russia is still waving the flag and hold, and the only one operating a breeder reactor right now. Uh, the, 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 the rationale for using this type of reactor has changed because, you know, it's obvious that we have not run out of uranium, and nuclear power growth projections were underestimated by a, a, an order of magnitude. 
Uh, and so it was then thought about, well, these reactors would help us reduce the amount of waste that would have to be disposed of by transmuting them into less troublesome isotopes. In 1996, while I was in the Energy Department, we asked the National Academy of Sciences to look at this. Oh, they report, we asked the National Academy of Sciences to look into this, and they reported that if everything worked using the spent fuel from the existing nuclear power fleet, it would take uh, about $740 billion in 2014 dollars and take 150 years to accomplish the transmutation of the plutonium. So, but it still goes on. The open nuclear fuel cycle is what we pursue right now, which is that we irradiate the spent fuel, we store it, and over time, if, uh, the pl if, if things work out, which they haven't for the last 50 or so years, we would dispose of this in a geologic repository. Uh, assuming uh, a large capacity worldwide of uh, nuclear power, uh, we will have reached about uh, 20,000 metric tons of plutonium worldwide. Uh, this gives you an idea of global nuclear power perspective. The third graph, which is Japan, you have to understand that all, all those reactors are shut down right now. But this tells you a lot about wh where nuclear power is and who, who has the most and where things stand. Um, this is a graph that shows you the, the accumulation of spent fuel inventories uh, by the year between 1990 and by the year 2030. And so uh, that spent fuel will accumulate approximately 5,000 metric tons of plutonium worldwide. Uh, this is another graph that gives you an idea of the age of the reactors because, uh, as you see, uh, the majority of the existing reactors are between 27 and 34 years old. And, being able to backfill that is going to be an enormous challenge. And despite the, the claims about this rather spectacular growth of nuclear power, it really remains to be seen. Uh, this is essentially a projection by the IAEA of uh, nuclear growth worldwide. And really, the one takeaway I have from this is that the top par part of the bar graphs basically tell you that China is, go is a place where nuclear power growth is expected to be significant. Um, but beyond that, how, mu how much nuclear power will China develop really is depending on a lot of factors. This is a graph about the United States nuclear weapons program. I publish, uh, I publish a regular column in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And this shows the, the budget projections for fiscal year 2014 to the year 2020 of uh, the weapons activities program in the Energy Department. Uh, how many of you, what percentage of the Energy Department's budget do you think goes for actual energy activities? What do you think? Any thought? Uh, about 15 percent. Two-thirds of the Energy Department's budget is for babysitting nuclear weapons, maintaining the nuclear arsenal, and cleaning up the mess that was created by generating these weapons. That's what two-thirds of the Energy Department's budget about. What this shows you here, in terms of the colors of this, once you start to, with the exception of these turquoise little bands, that's transportation there about, it, we spend about $250 million a year to move around nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons parts. You take that little, those little blue bands out and you, everything above the red is to keep the lights on. We're looking at an antiquated, oversized infrastructure that is uh, 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 costing four, at least 40% of the annual budgets just to keep the lights on for the nuclear weapons production complex. Uh, one thing I did is I decided to ask myself, well, if this were a business, what would be the per unit cost of nuclear weapons if you looked at the costs of, of, of maintaining an, an average warhead uh, uh, on an annual basis? And I looked at what it was 30 years ago when we had uh, uh, a large number of nuclear weapons. We had about uh, something like 23,000 nuclear weapons and what we have now, which is 7,300 nuclear weapons. And basically, uh, the number of nuclear weapons dropped by 300% since 1985. The per unit cost of nuclear weapons has increased by 500% over the same time period. So we're getting more bucks for the bang here. Uh, this is the run, one of the big dilemmas, I think, that we have to come to terms with, which is the large excess stockpiles of plutonium that have no credible disposition. The, the bar graphs in green are, the, are those stocks of plutonium that have been generated for civilian purposes. The black is for nuclear weapons purposes. 
we are trying to get we the United States are now trying to figure out a way to uh, to get rid of uh, a roughly 50 metric tons of excess plutonium that was part of our strategic nuclear stockpile, uh, and it's good. Oh, and it's going. To, basically, it's estimated to cost about thirty billion dollars. Plutonium has an, a negative value; it has no no inherent value. So, anytime you use it as a fuel, you're losing money. It's like it's the economics of some costs. We are also pushing the technology envelope in a way that I think will make the world a more dangerous place. Uh, we're beginning to. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is in the process of licensing the initial initial development of a new form of uh, uranium enrichment involving the molecular level uh, separation through lasers, tunable dye lasers of uranium. Uh, this is called Silex, and we're looking now at uh, enrichment facilities that used to consume a footprint of around 30 acres for the building to something that could be put into a Costco warehouse uh, that would have no, no really serious footprint that could be detected using uh, national means would use far less energy, would not have the, 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 the chemical signatures you would expect to find for an enrichment plant. Our Nuclear Regulatory Commission is refusing to perform a non-proliferation assessment of this technology and letting GE move forward. Uh, in the meantime, by the way, um, speaking of which makes signals, uh, the Republic of Korea, South Korea, we have a bilateral agreement with, with South Korea to for nuclear cooperation, and that agreement uh, is expiring this year, and the big issue is that Republic of Korea wants to be able to develop and acquire reprocessing technology because their spent fuel inventories are increasing and the public's becoming restive and they're very unhappy about all this nuclear waste piling up, and they figure, well, we'll, we'll quote, solve the nuclear waste problem. Uh, the State Department, to its credit, is arguing that no, they should not be allowed to reprocess, and they consider these 123 agreements, they're under Section 123 of the Atomic Energy Act, uh, that they consider the gold standard is for a country to agree with the United States to forego reprocessing and enrichment. In the meantime, in the Department of Energy's budget, we're spending $35 million to help the Republic of Korea develop reprocessing technologies. This is going on as we speak. There's a no, this is an example of what we call no adult supervision inside the U.S. government. Uh, we have really serious unfinished business of nuclear arms control and disarmament, a fissile material cutoff treaty, uh, which is a multilateral uh, effort. The major nuclear weapon states, the five declared nuclear weapon states, have stopped producing fissile materials for nuclear weapons for quite a long time now. We just simply stopped. We've got so much we don't know what to do with. Uh, the, the, one of the insane things about nuclear deterrence by the, by the early mid-1980s was that nuclear deterrence was actually being explicitly described in the terms of the winner of a nuclear exchange would be the one that had the most nuclear weapons left over. The, the United States and the former Soviet Union and Russia, I think, engaged in a grave strategic error in overbuilding its nuclear arsenals, and these are turning into giant millstones around our neck. Uh, we haven't a clue of how to really get rid of them in any significant way, and, uh, but we have to start doing this. Uh, the Obama administration, just one final thing. The Obama administration has a, pol uh, now that the non-proliferation uh, tre uh, non treaty review conference is up, the Obama administration has a quiet policy that it will not dismantle any of the weapons that it retires from the, the New START agreement uh, until a new uh, refurbished nuclear weapons complex is established sometime in the 2030s. Uh, this is the message that the United States is sending to the rest of the world at the NPT review conference. Uh, not only that, what uh, the U.S. G Government Accountability Office reported uh, last year that the Department of Energy, uh, National Nuclear Security Energy Agency, does not track the dates of their retired weapons. Can you imagine this practice happening in a grocery store? I mean, it isn't like, you know, some fancy thing to put to track the dates. And not only that, the GAO pointed out that the NNSA is quietly adding, reinstating hundreds of warheads to the stockpile. The stockpile is actually growing and we're not doing any uh, uh, adult supervision over this. Um, and the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty, it's not surprising that Pakistan 
in particular is, is uh, playing a key role in, in trying to block this. Uh, in conclusion, there are several challenges that threaten and unravel the nuclear nonproliferation regime in regions of long-standing conflict, particularly the Far East and the Middle East. Uh, many non-nuclear weapon states at the NPT review contract will protest and have protested the lack of progress being made by weapon states. The United, there's no good reason why the United States cannot uh, take, uh, take down uh, literally thousands of its nuclear weapons. It currently has about 60% of the total number of intact weapons that are not deployed. 40% uh, have been effectively retired. Uh, but we are sort of in the business of hoarding. Um, some of you may be familiar with the term of the cargo cults. Uh, these were the, uh, the primitive Stone Age people who encountered uh, industrial societies in the 20th century in the Pacific, like uh, Borneo and elsewhere. And the Japanese and the Allies eventually showed up mostly during World War II with airplanes, guns, metal, knives, mirrors, uniforms, boats, things that they, they couldn't believe. And then the war ended and everybody left, and anthropologists came back several years later and observed that some of these cultures were doing things like carefully preserving the runways, the docks. Uh, they had their, their religious leaders, their shaman or uh, a priest, whatever you want to call them, conducting religious ceremonies in uniforms, stamping pieces of paper. And they were asked, well, why are you doing this? It's because the gods had come, and if we don't preserve this, they'll never come back. And they were called cargo cults. I contend that we are maintaining a very large and expensive cargo cult in our nuclear weapons program. Um, uh, I, I sort of go through a shopping list of steps that are needed to strengthen a nonproliferation treaty. Uh, I won't sort of go over all these things, but uh, uh, there are several things that can be done to sort of tighten that treaty, but I think it's important to recognize that this treaty is not the end all to be all. It really depends, I think, largely on the United States and the nuclear weapon states to demonstrate real serious commitment and leadership in eliminating nuclear weapons. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Our last speaker is Robert Parry. Hmm? Robert Parry is the editor of Consortium News the first investigative news magazine on the internet. This site was meant to be a home for important, well-reported stories and a challenge to the inept but dominant mainstream news media of the day. He was one of the reporters who helped expose the Iran-Contra scandal for the Associated Press in the mid-1980s. Consortium News was founded in part due to fears that the decline of the US press corps foreshadowed disasters that would come when journalists failed to alert the public about impending dangers. His title is The Ukraine and the Human Factor, How Propaganda and Passions Can Risk Nuclear Conflagration. Robert. Thank you, Helen. Um, it's a What's that? All right. Um, I must say that I had a speech written, but after hearing all this, the uh, comments this morning, I've sort of thrown it out, or at least I've scribbled all over it. So I think I'll just kind of wing it, if you don't mind. Um, you know, as a, as a reporter journalist, um, I have a certain uh, perspective on some of these things um, that's a bit different from the scientists uh, that we've heard. And I do want to pick up on something that Seth was talking about, about the issue of probability of nuclear war. And, and he mentioned that there was a, a greater chance for a nuclear war at a time of crisis. And he said, I think very correctly, that um, that should drive us to want to reduce the possibility of these kinds of crises. Um, it, it is, as we see, however, there is a tendency in the way the U.S. political and media system works these days to actually encourage or to try to create crises, uh, certainly expand on them when they could be easily dismantled or diffused. 
And obviously a, a, a key point right now is Ukraine and how that's been handled. But before I get to that, I think it's important to talk about how um, in my time in covering Washington, D.C. since 1977, often for mainstream publications, we've seen, we've seen how, the, um, how the propaganda system can work in the United States and how it's become really quite uh, clever the way it, it meshes between politicians and the media and how, and how we personalize so much of how we see world affairs. Uh, it's become a pretty clear point, I think, that, that one way to get the American people riled up about some foreign conflict is not to talk about the, the controversy or the difficulties in some distant place, but to, to demonize some ruler. And we've seen this work very effectively over the past 30-some uh, years, 40 years since I've been around. Um, Ronald Reagan uh, demonized Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. He was, if you remember, Ortega was the dictator in designer glasses. We personalize it, make it kind of funny. Um, we get people laughing, and, and, we then, and then the propagandists can pull in the public and get them to go in the direction they wanted. We saw this with Noriega in Panama. The, the guy with waving his machete around. We saw this perhaps most uh, determinedly with Saddam Hussein in, in Iraq, who was, uh, I think George H.W. Bush called him worse than Hitler. And, and then there were propaganda elements around those things. Uh, if you remember in the Persian Gulf War, there were the, the, uh, the allegations about Iraqis taking babies off of incubators and killing them. These were essentially fabrications, but they touched the American people and got them into the right mood to go ahead for war. And we've seen this evolve as sort of a regular standard procedure. Uh, and now, of course, we're seeing it uh, in connection with Ukraine around Vladimir Putin. And one might say that Mr. Putin is, it makes himself a rather easy target sometimes for being demonized, but, but still there's this, there's this element of of ridicule and anger and hatred that often goes beyond what's, what's uh, actually happening. But it's a key way to get the American people to focus on a conflict in a way that gets them very emotional, gets them very angry, and gets them ready to fight. And so in the case of Ukraine, one of the, the curious things when I started covering this um, was that it struck me that it wasn't a very difficult issue to resolve. Um, basically, as, as actually just Spiegel did a very good job of this uh, recently in doing a chronology of how this crisis evolved. And, and basically, if you go back to um, November of 2013, you had a dispute between uh, involving uh, President Viktor Yanukovych, the elected president of Ukraine. Uh, he had been toying with the idea of uh, having an association agreement with the European Union. He was moving ahead on that, but then he was advised by his economic people back in Kiev that to abruptly terminate uh, economic dealings with Russia, their next door neighbor, would cost Ukraine $160 billion. So he told uh, Chancellor Merkel that he couldn't go ahead at this point. He wanted to keep negotiating, but he had to sort of figure out how to fill this hole. Now, that doesn't seem to be the kind of thing that, um, it's the sort of thing that political systems are supposed to handle. Um, yes, some people might think, yes, go ahead. Some people might say, well, let's take our time. Let's see if we can work out a situation where we do business with Europe, but also with Russia. Um, all that would seem kind of reasonable, I suppose. But it certainly upsets some people in Ukraine, and especially in Western Ukraine, where they had ideas that they could become more part of, of Europe. Uh, of course, people in, in eastern Ukraine, the more ethnic Russians, wanted to maintain their ties with their historic, uh, their historic relations with, with Russia. S so there was this difference. Um, and in the middle of this, as this political problem was playing out with the Maiden demonstrations, we suddenly see the United States, the, particularly some of our neoconservatives, jumping into it. Uh, we saw Senator McCain going, speaking to the, the protesters, speaking from a platform of one of the right-wing parties uh, under a banner honoring uh, uh, Stepan Bandera, who had, for a while at least, during World War II, collaborated with, with Hitler. 
And, and, and McCain said, the American people are with you. America is with you. We saw the Assistant Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, going out in passing out cookies. Um, and we, we learned that she had been, uh, in early February of last year, uh, having a conversation with the U.S. Ambassador, Jeffrey Pyatt, about who would be, who would be the new leaders of the government. Uh, she favored someone named Yatz. She says, Yatz is the guy. Uh, Yatz, of course, turned out to be Arseny Yatsenuk. Um, and then you see, and then you saw this, the crisis get worse. You saw groups from organized often in the western part of Ukraine, some of them very far right, some of them even neo-Nazis, being trained and brought into Kiev, uh, bussed in by the hundreds each day to change what had been a more or less peaceful uh, demonstration into something more violent. And that led eventually to increased death toll. There was a mysterious sniper attack, uh, which we still don't know exactly who did it but it was immediately blamed on Yanukovych and his people. Uh, and we saw these passions moving up, and it wasn't no longer just a, an issue of economics, it became sort of a mor morality play. And in the mix of this, as, then, as Yanukovych um, is essentially driven from power, he and his officials flee the country on February 22nd, then you see um, the United States moving in very quickly, and. Um, declaring this the legitimate government of Ukraine. And you see uh, Arseny Yatsenuk, Yats, becoming the prime minister. So obviously this, is, this has become a complicated issue, but it was one where the United States, US officials, uh, again, wanted to achieve something. You had people uh, like uh, these, some of these neoconservatives who have survived inside the Obama administration, some of them have actually gone ahead, and they certainly are supported by the think tanks, some of which we've talked about, and they are, are supported by much of the media. And this has become, so suddenly the issue of Ukraine became a morality play. We had our good guys, we had our bad guys, uh, Yanukovych was the bad guy, uh, there was even a badder guy named Vladimir Putin. And this is, so instead of it being something that could be handled, where there could be some federalized system or there could be some arrangement where it could work out, we ended up with the United States and Russia facing off in what became known as Cold War II. And it began over something, as I said, that was not particularly difficult for a political system to handle, but it was brought into this propaganda structure and it was brought in with the idea of, of turning Putin into something as Hillary Clinton uh, compared him to Hitler. And then there was talk about how he really had plans to sort of conquer, um, conquer Europe. He was gonna take the Baltic states back and re rebuild the Soviet Union. There's, by the way, no evidence of any of this. Uh, there, there's no intelligence. There's, there's nothing that supports these claims, but this became conventional wisdom in Washington. Even Henry Kissinger, in an interview with Joe Spiegel said, why would Putin have been doing the Sochi Olympics, trying to show, spending $40 billion to show how much he wanted Russia to be part of the West and part of the world system, and then turn around and try to cause trouble in Ukraine? It made no sense. But it became groupthink, and Washington is well known for its groupthink. We've seen the groupthink work uh, as it did back in 2002 and 2003 on in terms of uh, everyone believing there, there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and we saw the consequences. And we've seen this happen over and over again in Washington. It gets to these points about no adult supervision. It's sort of like the, it's like a, it's almost like some kind of animal house where people have sort of a, they start having fun, and before you know it, things get out of hand and people start dying. The difference with Ukraine, however, is that it's on Russia's border. And, that leads you to a, a di very difficult possible situation where if you have a situation where, there's a, where, where the Russians feel under pressure, the Americans feel that they're on the right, there are two conflicting narratives. The American narrative is that the Russians are the aggressors, that they're the ones causing all the trouble. The Russian view is that the Americans have been pushing NATO closer and closer to their borders, that, the, that they are, they're the ones under pressure, they're the ones being threatened. I'm told by one of my sources who has good ties in Moscow that 
that the, that the Russians are absolutely paranoid about the possibility of cruise missiles being placed somewhere in Ukraine. They were particularly worried about Sebastopol, their historic port on the Crimea. It was one of the reasons that they uh, moved in when the Crimeans said they wanted out of Ukraine and the next Crimea, so they could maintain Sebastopol. Uh, so you have these fears, you have these two sets of fears, or two narratives, and they have the danger of, of putting these two countries at a, at a point of making the next, next miscalculation. We've already seen how this works. There was um, someone apparently made a miscalculation and shot down Malaysian Airline Flight 17 last July 17th, which further aggravated this situation. The Americans immediately blamed it on the Russians. They blamed it on the Russian rebels and said that the Russian government had provided these missiles to shoot down the plane. Um, I'm told by people in, from connections to the CIA that, that, is, that, the, that some analysts at the agency don't believe that to be the case, that they were, they, were, they were basically opposing that as an argument. They could not find evidence that the Russians had provided those missiles. So, and they believe that it was a, some, some, some rogue element of the Ukrainian forces involved. Now, so it's still a mystery. We still don't quite know who did what, but instead of waiting for the facts, we jumped to conclusions. And that became, and that again drove this narrative, it drove this idea that, the, that Putin was this very dangerous figure who had to be stopped at all costs. And you even saw, you saw magazine covers like Der Spiegel saying, stop Putin now. You saw uh, his, basically him being presented as some kind of vampire. Someone passed, showed me that even the Economist has passed this month has Russia's, uh, Putin's war on the West. Now, Putin's view, of course, is sort of opposite. He thinks the West is at war with him. And when you have these two situations, you cannot, it becomes sort of easier to understand how you get to nuclear war. Because you have two nuclear states, you have many people in Washington now talking very openly about arming the Ukrainian military. You have the Ukrainian military talking about attacking and fighting the Russians. And you have this support of, uh, really across the American political spectrum. It's not just Tommy Friedman of the New York Times who's, who's talking about this sort of thing. It's also Nicholas Kristof, who's considered kind of humanitarian, liberal. He did a piece uh, last year about how, what, the, what the Ukrainians need from us are guns. And, so, and to take on the Russians, to go kill the Russian bear, as he put it. So now you have this the situation growing increasingly dangerous. And the, the, the possibility becomes that's, that there will be future miscalculations. There was, just a week ago, there was a, um, one of the senior officials of the Ukrainian government was speaking with Canada's CBC. And here's what he said. This is Ukrainian Deputy Foreign Minister Vadim Pristeko. He told uh, Canada's CBC that the Ukraine wants to have, quote, a full-scale war against Russia. Pristeka explained, quote, everybody is afraid of fighting with the nuclear state. We are not anymore in Ukraine. However dangerous it sounds, he said, we have to stop Putin somehow. So when you get to that kind of passion and that kind of uh, excessive language and that, and that kind of uh, dare the torpedoes approach, what you end up with is a situation where you could very easily slide into the next series of miscalculations and the next. And the, the Russians may feel that, that they are about to be attacked. And as, as Seth put it, I mean, if in those kinds of moments, um, it becomes more, more reasonable to expect you're going to be attacked. Uh, and so if you see a blip on the screen uh, showing that maybe it's a nuclear bomb or a nuclear uh, missile that's been fired at you, you're more likely to react, and, and vice versa. The Americans are going to be more um, tense about this because they know the Russians are feeling paranoid and, and are, are at risk. So, so what you encounter is that we create a situation where nuclear war is not something that is just an abstraction it becomes something that could actually happen. Uh, what's been most distressing to me, I would say, about uh, covering Washington during this, this period is that there's a, there's a cavalier, goofy quality to so much of what 
the, uh, the journalists and the media are, are, are doing, and the politicians as well, kind of a, a one-upsmanship. I can be more aggressive than you. I can, if you say you want to do this with the Russians, I'm going to do this with the Russians. And there's almost a bidding of, of tough talk and tough guyism and some tough galism too. I mean, it was Hillary Clinton who uh, was the first one to start comparing uh, Putin to Hitler this time. So I guess the point I'm trying to make uh, and what I've been doing, um, what some of our work at, at Consortium News has been focused on in the last year or so has been trying to write this story honestly, trying to tell it from both sides. It used to be a, a part of my profession that we, we believed, and sometimes it's not true, but we believed that there are always two sides of a story. And you're supposed to at least seek out the other side of the story and represent it fairly. Even if you don't like the people, you're supposed to represent it fairly. I've, I've covered, I've, I used to cover death squads in Central America. I've interviewed Roberto Dobuson. I, I dealt with the Tonton Makut in Haiti. I, you know, I didn't like these people, but I, it was a case of always trying to hear what their side was and understand it. And that was the job, I thought, of a journalist, to present both sides of the story honestly. Uh, and by doing so, give the American people the chance to then reflect back onto their politicians with an, a full understanding of what's at stake. Not to be led, not to be corralled, not to be well, the phrase that they like to use in Washington, a perception management. This, the, point of this, the point of what the U.S. government's been doing for so long now has been sort of captured in that phrase, perception management. They feel that, they're, that the job, especially after the Vietnam War, when the American people got kind of out of control, the idea of how do you bring them back into line with the policies of a more warlike position in the world, a more militaristic position. And so they set to work, and they set to work aggressively during the Reagan years. They brought in the CIA. Walter Raymond Jr. was the, was the top propagandist at the agency. He was brought into the National Security Council. He set up interagency task force on how to as they said, manage our perceptions. And they've done a pretty good job of it. And what's been also happening along those lines is that as the years have gone on, the American news media has increasingly fallen into line, increasingly become uh, a force to project, to reflect that perception management strategy rather than to contest it. And not, not, to, not to provide the American people an objective, fair, honest, full accounting of what's going on, but to tell, to tell you what's necessary to get you to support what they want to do in the first place. And I have to say that the, one of the worst places for this, in this recent round anyway, has been the New York Times. The New York Times has been, has been utterly disgraceful in how it has presented the Ukraine story. It is one-sided. Uh, you read these stories, they reek of bias. I could say the Washington Post um, has been no better. That's certainly true, but that's not saying much these days. The, Wa the Washington Post has become essentially a neoconservative newspaper and promotes neoconservative views. And the New York Times has increasingly moved that way too. And I kind of understand it as a journalist that, that you're, you're always looking out for your career. You don't want to be out of step. You want to make sure you get that promotion. You don't get fired. You don't get put on the overnight desk, whatever they can do to us. So you play ball. Uh, but playing ball in a case like this, especially, it's bad enough to do it on Iraq or on Panama or on Grenada or on Nicaragua or some other sad country. But to do it now on the border of nuclear armed Russia and to not understand the dangers that you're putting the world into and the American people into, it, it seems at some point your career is not that important. Anyway, um, I do want to thank you and thank Helen for this uh, opportunity. Thank you much, Robert. As you spoke at the end, I was reminded of Goebbels. Every time Hitler invaded another country, what Goebbels did was take over all the media and the women's magazines. So uh, that's what's kind of going on now, isn't it? Now, so we're proceeding into Q&A. Um, so if you've got questions, please pass them to the people in the aisles.
Well, really, Robert, you've answered this question. Do you think reporters or editors are responsible for one-sided reporting about the Ukrainian situation? <clears throat> well, I, obviously, yes, I, I do. I think that, I think what we've seen, and I, I must say, in my 37 years covering Washington, I have never seen anything quite like this. I, I have seen group thinks, I have seen, seen conventional wisdom, I have seen people in Washington go off completely half-cocked in the wrong direction. I have never seen something almost totalitarian like this, where there is a, a just a, an across the board, from essentially right to left and center, um, a, a way of presenting this story to the American people, which I'm not saying it's entirely wrong, but it is certainly highly one-sided. and. And it has not given the American people the kind of balance that they need to understand this very serious crisis. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought I didn't understand that part of it. The um, well, the way it works, and I've been I've been there. I've been in these situations. Uh, rarely do you get the strict orders to do a story a certain way but you certainly know which way your editor or your publisher wants to go with it. And you know that if you go against that grain, uh, you do so at your own career risk. Um, and even if you do the, your job very, very well, um, it maybe it may if you do it very, very well, it makes you even, even more vulnerable, you become a target. And you become a target of, of um, not just your competitors in, in the business, but also your editors might not want to back you, your publisher, your bureau chief, whoever's in charge of you will Make it clear that you're not wanted, that you are out of, that you're not someone that they think they want to have as part of your your group, their their organization, and so it's a mix of things. Uh, you know, and at the level I was at as a correspondent, uh, um, reporter, you often don't get it as directly as I'm sure my superiors got it from people in charge. But I would see you know, the, there was this great myth about the liberal media that existed throughout much of my time in Washington. And there's no really such thing as a liberal media. It was basically, it was run by, by people who tended to be fairly conservative, or at least, you know, um, very much pro-establishment, let's say. And, and so those, those people would, would pass on what they wanted. Uh, when I was at the Associated Press, the, the guy running AP was uh, named Keith Fuller. He was very conservative. He was a big supporter of Ronald Reagan. He gave, he gave speeches even. Um, about how Reagan's victory in 1980 was a major turning point for America, and how it was, uh, and how it was a time, as he put it, when it, he went through a whole series of, of terrible things that had been happening in America, and he said, "We don't, we don't want to have the union of, we want the union of Adam and Eve, not the union of Adam and Bruce," was was one of the things he was upset about at the time. So that sort of reflects the the kind of thinking that you often found from the higher ups. And when I went to Newsweek, it was even worse. Um, Newsweek was very much pro um, State Department. Uh, they they made it very hard on on their correspondents who were in the field reporting back honestly about things. They sent they they often fired them or removed them, sent in people who would report things the way the embassies wanted in the field. So that's how it came down. I'd like to add something about the media here. Um, part of the problem here in the, with the Ukrainian story, I think, is that the media, we have, um, the framing is different, not just the specific issues, but I don't think we understand the, the deeper framing of the questions between the West and Russia. And this has developed over a long period of time. Uh, there's, a, there's some very different cultural and value questions that are going on there that are not just specifically Ukraine which is a, just the latest manifestation of it. The other thing I wanted to say is that there are a lot of media opportunities which are languishing for lack of pursuit. So in the regional papers, for example, there are fantastic career niches. There are Pulitzer Prizes waiting for people uh, who will pursue issues assiduously, often with nonprofit help, who do FOIAs, who do real investigative work, and that can make an enormous difference. Um, one of the themes that could have been said about the weapons laboratories and the weapons complex is that there is a tension between visibility and invisibility. 
A lot of things happen no one knows about, but they're there in plain sight. Eight people were contaminated at Los Alamos lab in December with plutonium-238. It's never been in the newspaper. Plutonium-238 is much more toxic than plutonium-239, and one microgram of plutonium-239 is definitely carcinogenic if you inhale it or get it into your body. 238 is much more dangerous. By 100 times? Three, almost 300 times. 300 times yeah. more dangerous. And that's what they want to put in the satellites to power the satellites. Yeah. They already are. But the, the fact that the local paper did cover the kitty litter issue, brought that into visibility, and for the first time tore away all, every bit of the corporate profit uh, that had been designated for Los Alamos Laboratory and took two years of their contract away. And now Bechtel is reportedly considering whether they even want to be involved. Well, I mean, there, there is another example I'd like to draw your attention to, which is out at the Hanford site in Washington State. Hanford was uh, uh, the main, one of the main producers of plutonium for nuclear weapons going back to World War II. Fantastically contaminated site with it, uh, an enormous amount of radioactive waste. Literally hundreds of workers were requiring medical attention from exposure to hazardous vapors emanating from these waste tanks going on for years. And uh, despite efforts by the public interest community to sort of bring this to the attention, when I worked as a congressional investigator in the Senate in the late 80s, I mean, we were pounding on these guys about it. And the, the bureaucracy was impervious to this. Finally, uh, in the last two or three years, an intrepid reporter with the local TV Channel 4 station in Seattle, Kona, just was relentless and was doing carpet bombing on these guys and putting sick workers in front of the camera, having them tell their stories, how they were sort of just discarded uh, and forgotten and, uh, and uh, retaliated against. Eventually, this has now led to the unprecedented step by the state of Washington, the Attorney General, who is now filing a lawsuit for knowing endangerment at the Hanford site. It's just totally unprecedented for this to happen. Okay, the next question is for Bob Alvarez. I maintain that Adams for Peace was the stupidest uh, thing. What? Stupid idea. Stupid. Uh, wait a minute, not allowed to speak from the floor. Stupidest ideas Eisenhower ever had. Does Alvarez agree or disagree? Well, I think that if you pull the string and look at the history of this, it was originally uh, to, conceived as a public relations stunt that got legs uh, because of the uh, bureaucratic momentum and the the, the irresistible smell of money that was coming out of this for, from the Atomic Energy Commission, and it took on a life of itself. And it really didn't real it really didn't become much of anything when you think about this until around the late 1960s. I mean, there was a in the 1960s, the United States, Russia, or Soviet Union to a large extent, they were really sprinkling a lot of so-called nuclear goodies around the world, especially highly enriched uranium for research reactors. And there was a major push to commercialize nuclear power at this time. And in the United States, one of the pieces of untold history is that uh, the, by the mid-1960s, the United States had, had, uh, had produced so much fissile materials for weapons, it just didn't need to do it anymore other than a certain amount every year. And this caused a tremendous crisis within the bu bureaucracies of the Atomic Energy Commission. You have to understand these Department of Energy sites, or AEC sites, uh, dominate the wage and benefit structures of large geographic areas that have employed people for generations. And they just took that bit in the mouth and, pl and sort of pushed the peaceful atom. It was no coincidence that General Electric, which ran the Hanford site in the 1960s, was leading the charge for commercial nuclear power. Uh, there was a really big bandwagon effect that sort of took on a dimension of leadership by the Atomic Energy Commission and a certain amount of tremendous hubris 
uh, whereby, as, you, as I pointed out, that uh, people like Glenn Seaborg were envisioning you know, just doing their calculations as physicists on pieces of paper, assuming you know demand would be this and that, that uh, there would be this enormous growth of nuclear power without regard for the reality of it. And uh, I think that quite, quite frankly, you know, if you look objectively at what the Atoms for Peace program gave us, it gave us more and more nuclear weapon states. Yeah, and there was a uh, psychologist in the Pentagon at the time, 1956, who said, and his quote is in one of my books, that if people could accept the peaceful atom, they would not be so worried about nuclear weapons. In other words, it was a Trojan horse for the nuclear weapons industry. Um, no, you're not allowed to do it from the floor. Okay, leading members of the financial oligarchy have advocated population reduction to what they call sustainable level of one to two billion people. There are now powerful circles pursuing a strategy for limited nuclear war, targeting Eurasia, especially Russia and China, and leaving the US and parts of Western Europe intact. Do you see these two policies as connected? How can we work with China and Russia to prevent this? How can we defuse the Ukrainian trigger for war? That's, yeah, see it? Yeah. So first, uh, I have not heard anything at all about a, a plan for a nuclear war as a means of population reduction. I can't, <laughs> I can't deny that it exists, or I mean, I, I can't confirm that it doesn't exist, I should say, I mean, what, what do I know? But, but this is certainly never something that I've heard any serious discussion of uh, in, in any of the, the various uh, uh, policy and, and research corners that I look at. Uh, when we talk about overpopulation, it's an important uh, thing to be clear about with this idea of overpopulation because people itself isn't the problem. I and mean, we shouldn't be upset because there are too many people. People are nice. We are people. Right? The problem is not overpopulation per se. The, popul the problem is shortages of resources and, and things like that. And so when we think about overpopulation, what we should really be thinking about is resource scarcities and all the problems that can come from that. But resource scarcities are driven very differently uh, by some people than by others. Most of us living here in New York City or the United States or Australia or other wealthier countries are causing a lot more of the uh, resource depletion than people in, say, Southeastern Asia or Africa or Latin America who are less wealthy using less resources. So when we talk about uh, overpopulation, especially if we start throwing out ideas like, oh, let's get rid of a bunch of people in, say, Southeastern Asia, which is a you know, major locus of population, that doesn't really solve the core problems that we're talking about. Instead, what we should focus on is finding ways to have uh, the people that we have live good lives uh, without having to get rid of people. And that seems to me entirely feasible. Okay. Population management. Educate can the I, women and give them birth just, control. Can yeah? I say one thing about this? I think that sometimes um, you know, I, I don't, I, don't, I never heard anything like this before. However, the, there is something there. And in my talk, I called it the politics of disposability. And that's a very real phenomenon, domestically and internationally. Uh, Pepe Escobar is not the only one who talks about the empire of chaos, the United States. The neoconservative plan B for every failed plan A is to cause greater chaos. Um, war serves many interests. War is the health of the state, some say. Some of us, who said that? Uh, I forgot. Um, the, um, I don't think we should be naive about this. They feel in Russia, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people who feel in Russia that the United States wants to foment discontent and chaos all along the Russian borders. And I agree with that because I believe that there is, in fact, a very serious resource crisis which has already developed and which some people know about. 
Um, we don't, we are, the Department of Energy might as well be the Department of Propaganda about energy. Um, we do not understand this in the United States. We project uh, a very false picture about this to Europe, to ourselves, uh, and base a foreign policy on it. Um, and yes, I think that uh, empire of chaos, which means uh, a lot of suffering, is very much part of some people's idea. And it's up to us to keep those factions in check and push their power down in this country because they will continue to grow and gain power. And they are right now dominant. Okay, I think this is for Robert Parry. Does the placement of former military branch intel officers into media management account for some of the Pentagon lockstep media? <clears throat> well, if you go back historically, um, and I've spent a lot of time at the Reagan Library, maybe too much time at the Reagan Library, but the, um, what you see is that, they, is that when the Reagan administration came in in 1981, they recognized that their biggest problem in terms of dealing with the world was what they called the Vietnam Syndrome. And the Vietnam Syndrome was that the American people had been gotten fed up with being taken into wars that were ill-conceived, that were sold to them under on false pretenses, they didn't trust the government, they didn't want to go uh, back into something like that again. And, that, and, the, and the Reagan people recognized that that was a huge obstacle to what they wanted to do in the world. So, I think I mentioned briefly, they, they literally took the top propaganda figure, the uh, top ranking person in the Central Intelligence Agency, Walter Raymond Jr., and they moved him over to the National Security Council staff. Um, and with, Case, with William Casey, the director of CIA's oversight, they targeted the American people uh, with propaganda, and they were uh, and they had interagency task force that handle it. They, one of their made major, major bases was at the State Department, the so-called Public Diplomacy Office for Central America. Um, that's where I, I dealt with them a great deal at that time. And these people were, a lot of them were, this was staffed with neocons. This is where some of the neocons sort of cut their teeth in coming to, to age in Washington. Uh, the guy, one of the guys I dealt with um, uh, extensively at this office was Robert Kagan. Uh, Robert Kagan um, uh, was a, is a leading neoconservative. He's still very influential. He, um, uh, he was one of the two co-founders of the Project for the New American Century in, in 1996, advocating the, or 1998, I think it was, sorry, that advocating the, um, uh, the invasion of Iraq. Um, he happens also to be the husband of Victoria Nuland, who is the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, who was the, one of the key figures in the coup that occurred a year ago in, in Ukraine. So, so, but basically, they, they, so they, they basically cut their teeth on this idea of manipulating the American people, and, they, and, they, and that became a central element of everything they do, and they're very good at it. They're very articulate, they're, uh, they write well, um, they're smart people, and they are now throughout, not just the government bureaucracy, not just the Defense Department or the State Department or other agencies of the government, they, they permeate the media, uh, they are in the Washington Post op-ed pages, they, uh, they, they fill the, the think tanks. I think earlier one of the speakers was talking about how the think tanks operate, they're basically funded by much of the military industrial complex. And, and the military industrial complex has an interest in promoting ideas that lead to more conflict. Duh. You know, it's sort of the obvious. But so, and, and so the, so the neoconservatives have this regular um, trough of money. They also have the National Endowment for Democracy, which was set up in 1983. And in 1983, the, the idea was how do you, um, how does, how do you do CIA type interference around the world without it being tainted as CIA. And what, so what they came up with was the National Endowment for Democracy, which was, which has been, which was run then and is run today by a neoconservative named Carl Gershman. Um, Carl Gershman, uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in September of, of, of 2013, this is before, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 2013, before the crisis in Ukraine really began, 
he wrote a piece in the Washington Post where he said Ukraine is, quote, the biggest prize, and he saw it as a way to ultimately get Putin removed from leadership in Russia. So these ideas were already in play in the neoconservative community much earlier. And I think the other, and the other interesting thing here, going back to this point that, that Greg made about the empire of chaos, the neoconservatives, I think they have ideas that, that in their think tanks sound good. Like, okay, we'll invade Iraq, we'll get rid of Saddam Hussein, we'll put in Chalabi, we'll have it all, everything will work fine. And the real world then confronts them. And, they, and that doesn't turn out as well, and, become, and it becomes, becomes chaos. But instead of learning, they just move to the next level. And the ultimate level, I, I sort of compare it to the old the, the children's ditty about the little old lady who swallowed the fly and then she you know, swallows the spider to catch the fly. And eventually she ends up uh, swallowing a horse and she's dead, of course. But so, so, now, so now the neocons have moved this, escalating this up through Iraq, through Syria, through now they want, they want to have war with Iran. They, they have all these ideas. And of course, Putin has been in their way. He was helping the Syrians, helping the Iranians. He helped, he helped Obama avoid uh, a war with, in Syria back after, in, in August of, of 2013, if you remember, after the sarin attack. It was Putin who came in and said, we'll get Assad to give up his chemical weapons. So, so Putin has been a problem, and so they keep escalating. And now they're up to this, and, and they are actually thinking about, this is real, they are thinking about, as Gershman made, made reference, how do you destabilize the government in Moscow? And this is a brilliant idea. We have to get rid of Putin. How do you stop Putin? This is the stuff all these things are about. That's right. So, but now you're at this point. Okay, you destabilize Moscow. You destabilize Baghdad. That worked out really well. What if you destabilize Moscow? It doesn't mean that you're going to have some wonderful, you know, mild-mannered guy taking over after Putin has been hanged at the village square. You could end up with uh, an extreme nationalist. I mean, this is just as likely as you are to get some nice guy, someone much worse than Putin, you know, not nearly as rational as Putin. So you could end up then, and this gets back to this whole nuclear issue. If, if you do that, if you destabilize Russia, you could end up with a very realistic situation where some very dangerous person gets control of the nuclear codes of Russia. And then where are you? Now the neocons would probably at that point say, well, you know, we have to do something else. But this is how they don't think things through. And by, I, by, I do think it's bigger than just uh, what the you know, having this Pentagon kind of control. That's part of it, but that's only, a, I think, a smaller part. So I have a naive question. What is a neocon? From, what is their psychology? Where do they hail from? What are their origins? I don't understand what neocons are. Well, I think, well, neocons are a mix of things. I mean, some of them, there are elements of cold, the old Cold War. They have this sort of longing to be, to be part of that. They're, they obviously have a very strong view in the Middle East in terms of Israel's security, and they've seen, and they, so they view some of these things through that prism. They've, you know, they've made that clear. They feel that there has to be an effort to stop some of the groups that have threatened Israel. And that, you know, so Hezbollah is one of those groups. Who helps Hezbollah? Well, the Iraqis might, maybe the Iranians. So you have to sort of keep going after some of those groups. So you have a mix of things, uh, and you have also this issue of just being very tough. They, they, they have a very uh, Cold War mentality of, of being the, mo the most macho people on the block. And that really is very effective in Washington, because as someone said earlier, I think, in one of the earlier presentations, Washington's a place where everyone wants to be the toughest guy, the toughest rhetoric. And that takes on a life of its own, It's because it's not just rhetoric in Washington, because Washington's a place with enormous power. So I think the neocons are kind of a mix of, of some of those things, but they, but they have become, uh, they become, they've become a sort of a definable group in that they favor these very hyper-aggressive approaches to the world. And they push this idea of American exceptionalism, that we don't have to abide by any rules, and that we should just therefore do whatever we want. And, it, and regime change is the way it goes. Part of it comes out of the fact that they got tired of like, negotiations, too. Some of this followed Oslo. Where, they, where the, the people got tired, some of the neocons were tired of having negotiations that didn't go anywhere in the Middle East, so let's do regime change instead. So they came up with this idea, and then they put it into play. Thank you. Um, next question. Recently, the director of the International Red Cross said in an interview what should be obvious, that it's ill-equipped to provide the Red Cross, 
adequate relief after nuclear war. Greg mentioned that even the humanitarian weapons con conference, the humanitarian weapons conference sugarcoats the horror. Is there any way to get the public to face the humanitarian consequences, including the massive tasks of reconstructing both the victorious and vanquished states? So there's a few things going on here. One is, can the public be engaged on this? I and mean, the answer is yes, but it takes a lot of effort. I mean, the public's distracted with lots of other things, and including things that are not at all so serious, and including other serious things from global warming to, to what have you. Uh, and I think it's important to have events like this, and, and I'm glad to see that it's being uh, uh, live streamed on the internet so that more people can watch it, because regardless of the fact that the Cold War has ended, and regardless of the fact that the, the tensions well until last year seemed to have died down between the United States and Russia, the weapons still exist. And people need to hear that. Right? The weapons still exist, and as long as these weapons still exist, they demand our attention because they're just that powerful. And so how do we make that happen? It's just, it takes a lot of effort. It takes smart media strategy. It takes smart, smart networking, you know, social media, and so on. But it can be done. It just, it just takes effort. Thanks for that. Yes? That, that's a hard problem, but maybe just one or two things that the character of the engagement of the public is reciprocally related to the content uh, that can be assimilated. So the more people are involved the, with, and the more committed the types of involvement there are, the types of actions, the types of memberships, the types of uh, life changes, the, the more challenging the content that can be assimilated positively uh, I think, um, and uh, that's certainly been our experience uh, at the study group. We lack infrastructure. There's a tendency for all of us to um, speak of the public in a kind of amorphous way. Um, we aren't thinking as, mu as well as we should about the structure of public involvement, the organization of that involvement, um, uh, the role of vanguards and small groups which can formulate and carry out leadership. Um, we have a very atomized society and people feel quite alone and quite frightened and quite overwhelmed by the minutia of their daily life, let alone any illness or other family crises that may occur. Uh, many, uh, it took me quite a while to realize that the people who are coming through the door of the study group in Santa Fe were um, everyone was to some, one degree or another rather wounded by, uh, and that made them sensitive, and that made them able to appreciate the, uh, the problems that we had, but it also meant that there needed to be some kind of infrastructure, some kind of uh, structure for uh, helping people work together. Um, and that's why I said in my talk we have to uh, do things. We have to be doctors, not talk about. Uh, I mean, it's, I'm very glad we're here, and I'm very glad we're doing this, and I have no complaint about that. It's wonderful. But um, we do, we have to take it, when we, when we leave, this, this, leave this meeting, we have to take the next step. Thank you. Um, I think the last question is, nuclear risk must be seen in the context of the geopolitical and economic consequences of the capitalist class in the United States in its quest for world domination. I guess we've heard about that from the neocons. The use of NATO by the US increases the risk exponentially. How can civil society in the US curb the power and destabilizing effects of NATO? So I don't have a good answer to the specifics of that question. I will say this is a, a good question. What I like about this question is that it's thinking systemically, right? We have nuclear weapons. Uh, we have you know, military forces that are responsible for these nuclear weapons. But there's more going on here than just that. There are political systems. There are economic systems, cultural, social, and so on, all that play a role in what happens with these nuclear weapons. And so if we want to tease out what the best ways to reduce these risks are, 
I definitely, I like the spirit of the question, which is,